And then also like, that was my first ever red carpet. Every celebrity that I like ever had a slight sexual fantasy about came up to talk to me. I was completely, oh, damn. <laughs> completely like overwhelmed by the entire event. Um, but it was so awesome because I sat at a table with Jamie Lee Curtis um, and I've always loved Jamie Lee Curtis and she had watched my show. And when I didn't win, she gave, she was like, was like, let me see your hand. And she gave me this little golden ball, like a golden globe and closed it in my hand and was like, you deserve this. That's so precious and cool. <laughs> that was worth everything. Like if I never act ever again, like that was so meaningful that I'm good. Today on the show, we are joined with Golden Globe nominated actress, Sarah Hay. Sarah is mostly known for her series, Flesh and Bone, but currently she's on the cusp of releasing a new film titled Unidentified Objects that's playing this week on May 27th at the Inside Out Film Festival in Toronto. And it is awesome. You should go see it. But around talking about this film today, this might be one of our favorite recorded conversations we had this year. Sarah is a real one, guys. Totally rad as fuck. We get some amazing stories from her. Started off as a ballet dancer and was randomly casted in a Mary-Kate and Ashley film. Skip ahead, she talks to us about her experience at the Golden Globes, amazing stories, interactions with Jonah Hill, a beautiful moment with Jamie Lee Curtis. And in the middle of this interview, it is revealed to me that her boyfriend is Brandon Boyd of Incubus. Also around all that cool stuff, we just talk about life, passions, using psychedelics such as magic mushrooms for medicinal purposes, and even whether she does or does not believe in aliens. Can't say it enough, this one was so fun, and I think you guys are gonna really enjoy this one. Here is the ever so awesome Sarah Hay. Just, just how, how's everything going today? Um, it's horrible, but everything's relatively good. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, I lost my passport a couple of days ago and I'm supposed to come to Toronto on Wednesday and finding a way to get a new one has been pretty interesting. Um, so I spent my morning at the passport office and then somebody found my misplaced passport after a week of freaking out. And so then I'm literally there with the papers like, all right, I'm ready to just pay however much money to get me across the country. Like literally the storyline of the movie I'm promoting mm, yeah. <laughs> as fast as possible. And um, I ended up my friend found it in his office <laughs> oh damn i hate that feeling of panic but i'm so happy uh you ended up finding this too and yeah passports are so expensive if you need them in a rush and even it's not guaranteed you will get it in the couple days i had a moment to uh the other year too where i couldn't find mine i had to go on a plane and it just it's uh it's a panic yeah, it's a massive panic and it feels like every person in LA did not want me to get it today. <laughs> like, oh man, it's like, just one of those days, but otherwise everything is absolutely lovely. So. Oh, that, that's great. And yeah. uh yeah, like just watching the movie too. I want to say uh I loved your character and uh I kind of was like reading a bit on you too of, of your acting history and uh you've been doing this for a while now and I think it's just just uh just awesome even uh going back and i saw at the beginning like this might be your debut or it's like the first thing recorded you were like in a mary kate and ashley film or something yeah yeah when i so i was like really teased as a kid at ballet school and because ballet is super like let's let's talk about how to stuff your body into like one thing that everyone should look the same like modeling kind of thing and and i was really um i was kind of like a I wouldn't even say a chubby kid for ballet. I was considered a chubby kid. And the, you know, the Hollywood people came into the ballet studio and I'm like this nerdy kid in the back with my pink scrunchie. And they're like, all right, so let's, let's audition the girls. And all of these like popular girls came forward and did their audition and they all, you know, tried their best and they had all their designer leotards on. And I fumbled forward and they're like, we'll take that one. <laughs> and it forever changed my childhood because all of a sudden I was the kid in the Mary Kate and Ashley movie. <laughs> oh, that's so badass. Yeah, it was nice because I guess um they said that they wanted us to look more like actors because all the other kids were like trying to be really skinny and you know, I looked like mm. a normal kid, so it worked out. 
<laughs> yeah, that's so awesome. Would you say that moment just uh, like totally changed your directory? Like, were you thinking prior to that, that I want to be an actress? Or was this like a thing that just kind of put you on the path? It didn't happen until way later. I was a professional ballet dancer for almost 25 years before I started acting I, because I was performing when I was like four and five years old already. And um, I ended up continuing this dance career. I moved to Europe, I, I did the whole thing. And then I got an audition for this TV show called Flesh and Bone, which is a, it was on stars. It got nominated for all these awards, but it was like a ballet drama. And so mm. and they're like, I wonder where we can find like an unhinged kind of like edgy psycho bitch to play this part. Um, <laughs> so they called me in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> with the tattoos and the, you know, the whole thing. So they, they were looking for someone with a little edge, which usually gets you in trouble in ballet. Um, and I ended up booking that, shooting it. That was like my first real, real acting job. And that was in 2016. And then I got nominated for a Golden Globe, which was like, a life-changing event that's so amazing and yeah I was reading about the Golden Globe too and I wanted to ask you uh how does that feel like when you're like an actress and finally getting like a moment like that where it's like oh my god I'm like being put up for this award right now that uh you usually see like growing up on your television and stuff like that's like the big one yeah, it was weird. There were a couple of things about it that were really funny. Like it was the year that Lady Gaga hit Leonardo DiCaprio while she was walking to the stage. She won for like American Horror Story. And he, there's like this meme of him going like, when she walks by. <laughs> Very iconic year of Leonardo DiCaprio snubbing Lady Gaga, which was really funny. And then also like, that was my first ever red carpet. So I was out there, I was actually wearing Harvey Weinstein's wife's designs. Um, mm. At the time, I didn't know who Harvey Weinstein was because I hadn't really grown up in this industry. Yeah, so um, you didn't know the controversy or anything oh, like that. No. Yeah. And I knew that the only thing I knew is that my manager told me, we really want to get the attention of Harvey Weinstein. And so we're going to wear this dress. And I was like, all right, let's go. You know, like, it's just like throwing me to the wolves. Every celebrity that I like ever had a slight sexual fantasy about came up to talk to me. I was completely, oh, damn. <laughs> completely like overwhelmed by the entire event. Um, but it was so awesome because I sat at a table with Jamie Lee Curtis um, and I've always loved Jamie Lee Curtis and she had watched my show. And when I didn't win, she gave, she was like, was like, let me see your hand. And she gave me this little golden ball, like a golden globe and closed it in my hand and was like, you deserve this. That's so precious and cool. <laughs> that was worth everything. Like if I never act ever again, like that was so meaningful that I'm good. <laughs> like, yeah. That's it. That story actually gave me a goosebumps too, because Jamie Lee Curtis is one of my favorite actresses uh, and everything. That's like so cool that you had that moment and everything. And even like, like you mentioned too, just uh, even being around like all these dudes that you probably like fangirled over, like when you're younger and it, like having that moment, like, oh, this is surreal. Like I've had a couple of moments too, where I've been taken off guard that, uh, I met somebody who I used to have a poster of in my high school locker, uh, this pro wrestling girl. And I remember just like when I met her, like I wasn't prepared and I just kind of like froze and never been so like tongue tied. It almost felt like my brain wanted to say a million things at once and couldn't form it into like a sentence. Uh, do you remember like any of your interactions when you were like meeting these people? Like, <laughs> Totally. I mean, I, the one that really stuck out was, um, it was not so much my childhood fantasy, but meeting Jonah Hill was really like, cool. I, that was really kind of starstruck you because you just, you know, when you'd see him at, you'd imagine it'd be really disarming. Cause he's just like a kind of, you know, one of the guys vibe. And he was, it was the year that he dressed up like the bear from the Revenant. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's amazing. <laughs> he like, was like, Cinderella, you're lost. And I was like, <laughs> Oh my God, I don't know what to say right now. Yeah. What's funny about that is that I actually ended up, I'm in a relationship and I've been with this guy for a really long time with the poster that I grew up with. Wow, yeah. <laughs> that's okay, that's so a like life achievement. <laughs> yeah, I had like Justin Timberlake and Kurt Cobain mm -hmm. and Brandy Boyd from Incubus. And then I was like, all right, 
I'm going to marry Brandon Boyd from Incubus. And somehow I ended up here with Brandon Boyd from Incubus. So <laughs> that's, that's awesome. And uh, that's, I didn't know that. And uh, yeah, I used to spin Incubus all the time in my high school and just had, uh, I probably owe them money because I used to burn a lot of CDs back in the day when I was broke. So I probably owe them like 40 bucks, a couple albums. I, I burned, but <laughs> I'll e-transfer you later. <laughs> institutions owe them a lot of money <laughs> yeah that's uh that's the business so that's so cool this is like uh very exciting to hear all your stories yeah he ended up executive producing the movie because he saw a cut like a late cut of it um and he did some music supervising on it as well wow so that's so that's why the music's so good in the movie. Cause like right at the opening sequence, like I'm like, oh, this all makes sense now that you're saying this. I'm, I'm like, oh, this, this, these are some good like tracks, like kind of just spacey, like fitting the theme and stuff. Totally. And I think he, um, you know, he has all these unique relationships with people, but there's an artist that has a bunch of songs in the movie called Perfume Genius. Um, mm -hmm. His name's Mike. He's like this kind of like ethereal, magical, spacey like powerful queer music um really like queer narrative at times where you just like don't get to hear that so much of like men loving men or women loving women in like a in a song form mm -hmm. um and so we like love him and we put him in it and you know brandon made all these calls for us and helped us get all the music together because the movie is uh you know it's outer space it's definitely sci-fi and that's his most famous lyric is meet me in outer space <laughs> yeah i love that too and yeah i didn't know like that aspect of uh of the music too with the collaboration as well because it is at uh lgbtq fest in toronto yeah. and um i knew your co-star uh the second main character to you was was uh was a homosexual and like kind of like on that but i didn't know like it was even embedded into like the, the, the sound production and stuff like that that's like really cool to hear and everything yeah we wanted to try to make it as inclusive as possible you know in in a non-cliche way like mm -hmm. you know, not the virtue signal let's just put a person in there because they're gay it's like who's the mm -hmm. best fitted like most talented person that we can like help rise up by getting this out there and he is you know perfume genius he is so amazing and we were actually really lucky to get him in the end you know so I, I love the idea of just like championing weird and different and non-mainstream stuff when it comes to movies. And I produced the movie as well because I believed in this like small indie project that I felt like could really, you know, change the narrative about, you know, a couple of the main themes of the project. But one of them being that the other character is a little person and mm -hmm we don't get to see a lot of little person representation in Hollywood um, besides Peter Dinklage. And then, you know, throughout history, it's been a little bit like um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And then I mean, you've got the Wizard of Oz. And it's like these people like who aren't people, they're like magical creatures, but not mm, just like a normal yeah. guy who lives in New York, just like, you know, Matthew, the, the character. Um, you know, just trying to live their life and be happy and just so happen to be differently able. Like Coda is the first real film I've seen in a long time that has um, those kind of groundbreaking themes where we're getting to see like sign language on screen. And it's not just for people who, who have hearing impairments. It's it's a real film for everyone. And I wanted to do the same thing, be part of something that allows differently able people to just be people. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I love the dynamic between your two characters as well. Like right off the bat, like just like kind of like the tone and like the way you guys were like interacting. I'm like, oh, if these guys, we're just going to follow them too. Like, I'm going to love this movie. And yeah, uh, yeah just uh, how was it? Uh, it seemed like it was probably like a, a fun role to play, especially having a co-star like that as well, where you guys can banter back and forth and and oh. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was so much fun to film. I think the the best thing is we're like kind of two Jewish grandmas at heart. So, you know, the bickering comes really easy when it's all in good spirit. Um, but he, you know, he's such a wonderful actor and, and getting to just play around with a character like my character Winona is such a privilege because I usually get cast in things where I have to be like a drug addict or an abuse victim or... Mm. You know, something that's really really heavy and complex which is great and in this case she's super complex but because she's kind of 
um, just slightly different than a mainstream girl. Like she has different dreams and different goals and she's fun and, and, and deep and excited about life and meets this really curmudgeon -y character and, you know, kind of forces him out of his thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that, by the way, too. Especially yeah. like the character is just like super strong and driven. And she's like, I need to get to this place. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm just going to make it happen. And that's awesome. Like, including like trying to like steal cars and we're like, we're just doing anything you can to make it happen. I will literally kidnap you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, that's that's so awesome. And um, yeah, just again to like, um, I'm a big geek to like sci fi stuff and even the whole possibility of aliens. And even like the pat or last year, I was working for this one YouTube channel. And uh, one of one of the channels under the umbrella, we were covering the story of the Pentagon was about to release information that uh, about the UFOs that was like the big thing last year and we we had like a countdown it was going to be like on this day at this time and like the channel was doing well getting like all these hits and then I remember the day of we were so excited and they just like had a press release it's like yeah we don't know what they are <laughs> we're just like oh shit and at first we're, we were like kind of disappointed and then at the and then later we're just like that's actually kind of scary like and uh, I just want to know, like, what's what's your take on, like, the possibility of visitors or anything like that? Oh, they're already here, in my <laughs> opinion. I think mushrooms are from another planet. <laughs> mm, yeah. Helium is, like, is the most alien thing in the entire world. Although we have, like, a lot of fungus in our bodies and we're, like, close. I think we're the closest related to to mushrooms and fungi than than anything else right mm -hmm, yeah so I'm 100 sure so don't quote me on that but i will say that i i think that there is definitely life on other planets and i definitely think that they've interacted with us and i live in a really hippie community of people who like go and do like laser interactions <laughs> and stuff oh, that's so cool <laughs> and i've been to area 51 i've done the whole thing like i i definitely believe that there are aliens and i and i believe that um it could be the end of the world when they interact with us <laughs> mm, yeah uh, you know what uh it's like I feel like I, I gather like a lot of information because I'm like so fascinated on it but it's almost like I get this feeling of like I don't know what to believe it's such an unknown and that's what makes it exciting for me as well but uh yeah that would terrify a lot of people I think it it depends on how you see it because the unknown can be really scary but it can also be really freeing if you mm -hmm. don't don't attach to anything and you're just like I just don't really know anything do I so I may as well just enjoy myself <laughs> Yeah, hell yeah. I like how you mentioned like the laser interactions too. Like, so are they trying to like communicate or get their attention? Is it like close encounters of the third kind where they're like playing the song? And I think they're doing stuff like that. I haven't gone to it, but there's like these like circles that people have up here and there's labyrinths all over the place. I live in Topanga, California. Cool. Um, it's pretty much just like the most hippie place on in California for me um, <laughs> in Los Angeles. And I think people go and they like assemble in circles and they bring all these different lights and then they like chant and like kind of try to I don't know invoke some kind of spiritual connection to aliens I don't know if aliens are just looking at them like what the fuck are you doing <laughs> yeah 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 like they don't they think they're not getting their attention but the aliens are just like ignoring like yeah we're too cool for you guys <laughs> like hey Bob look at these idiots <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah, they're doing that that weird thing again with the lights. <laughs> yeah, I always uh, like the South Park take on it, uh, where the aliens are just watching us like a, a reality show, and it's like today on Earth, and it's just like Russia's in Ukraine are at it again, and then it's like showing like all the celebrities, and they're just like six armed creatures like eating popcorn, like yeah, yeah, <laughs> like just the trashiest television. I mean, I love Rick and Morty, so I'm right there with mm. you. Yeah, yeah. Anything, anything in that world I'm down I'm down to talk about alternate universes and all of it <laughs> yeah, that's so awesome and speaking of and uh also uh just to say like if you're uncomfortable talking about what I'm gonna ask you we can cut this out this is all edited but uh I was just like wondering like you mentioned like uh just 
how you thought like mushrooms could be alien and stuff. And have you ever had like um, some psychedelic experiences yourself or like experimented with that? Or if you wanted to talk about that, like, um, it... well, yeah, no, I've been, um, I'm like an advocate for micro dosing. Mm -hmm. so, I think that eventually, you know, in the next, I keep like saying in the next 10 years and then three years go by and then the next 10 years, but I do think in the next 10 years, it's going to become more mainstream, like, you know, marijuana did, and that maybe it won't be such a, a taboo subject matter anymore, because it's really, I had really, really bad ADD when I was a kid, I still have a, a hard time focusing, like I'm always searching for novelty, just going, 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 going. Mm -hmm. And when I was a kid, I was given Adderall, and it benefited me a lot um for ballet because it was making me really skinny and making me really like hi like hyper so physical activity was really like it's really great for that but I always end up you know I, I would feel like crap at night and then I would you know it, it just wasn't doing what it was meant to do for me and I started micro dosing as an adult um this company silo actually that I really like and they're they're not fully public yet but they're working on it um, but it's like gummy bears, you know, and it's a very mm -hmm. tiny amount of psilocybin to the point where you can't even feel really the effects of it. It's mostly just like a, um, a, a little bit of like a focus point and not a big hallucinogenic, like, because I, yeah. I wouldn't want to feel that. I just want to mm -hmm. be able to focus and I want to do it with natural remedy. Like rhodiola is another thing like people are like try rhodiola or try this or try that and then none of those things really worked for me and so the microdosing has been super awesome mm -hmm. and I feel like i'm actually a you know better version of myself since i've been doing it um so yeah i'm ad i'm an advocate i i love mushrooms aesthetically i'm really fascinated with the mycelial network i think like trees talking to each other and stuff in their own language is pretty awesome that they can talk to mushrooms <laughs> yeah it's it's so amazing when you you think about it too and it's just like there's like science that backs it up and again it goes back to like taboos and even i remember when i was younger and i first like experimented with mushrooms i was a teenager and it was like looked at as like a big no and like almost like a party drug and i remember i was with like my close friends and by a fire and we did it and we thought like oh yeah we're gonna do this and get wild and then it just turned into like this very beautiful deep emotional experience and you you said the you just basically said like oh like when you uh microdose you kind of like feel like a, a better person i remember the next day it almost felt like my soul had like this cleanse and i was closer to people and like I wanted to call my mom and tell her I loved her and like, just like, it was, it almost took like, um, a layer of anxiety I had and like in the world and just made me see things for what they are in like, it sounds complex, but it made everything more simple and like more connected. And it's almost like I'm trying to explain something that's a feeling and it's unexplainable, but, uh, I think it's amazing. And, uh, uh, obviously I got to put out like a little warning, like if you've never done them before too, it's all about kind of like setting and with the right, being around the right type of people. And just even if you're looking to experiment it, like try it in moderation before, cause it can, <laughs> you could like go to like another place where you might not be able to handle it, but, um, it's you so can, fascinating. You can seek out therapeutic settings for it. If you're like mm -hmm. afraid it and and I was reading this book um by Michael Pollan there's two books one of them is how to change your mind the other one is this is your mind on plants and he's like an, you know he's like an older guy I I'm not quite sure maybe like 60s and he, you know wanted to try psychedelics for the first time in his life in his 60s and so that's like a really good book if you're like oh I'm I want to try this but I'm scared or I don't know what to do how to change your mind great book and the other thing was that I was reading his other book, This Is Your Mind on Plants. And it's like, there's this whole narrative about how caffeine has shaped our culture. 
you know, because people wake up, they need their coffee. This is like thousands of years in the making of, of a society that is so dependent on this one drug that comes from the earth that, that everyone's okay with because it didn't make you see something weird, but it makes you a little jolty and it makes you like need this. And then you need the coffee or else you can't go to work or can't do the thing. You have to stop. You have to map out a way to get the coffee. Like that to me is more of like a drug than mm -hmm. doing this having like a, a dose of psilocybin with a therapist once a year so that you can work on your depression. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I totally agree. So it's just like what's allowed in our society and what's not allowed in our society and who's making those decisions. You should make your decision on what you want to do and, you know, don't give it to babies and stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well said, Sarah. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's don't awesome. I got it. <laughs> yeah 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 no that's it's so true yeah and even like you mentioned too like the little things like whether it's like coffee or sugar which I'm a slave to and I will admit it but I have stints where I'm like I need to stop drinking so much coffee and I notice like a few days after there's withdrawals from it like yeah I'll be like all freaking jittery and like and like my mind is like yo it's just like if you have a coffee you'll be all right and like I'm like toughing it out and it's wild that that does that to your body does it do you need it or does it need you Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> to keep growing yeah it's really really interesting but I I'm just of the mind of if you can you know find something natural that makes you feel um better then mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's amazing. And um, on the show too, I talk to artists from like all four sorts of things like beyond film, music, all this different stuff. And I noticed there's like a lot of like connection to the types of personalities, even they, even though if they're doing different things, like it's very, it's this been such like a crazy, like social study of the like, creativity in a way too and there's one question I started asking recently every episode and I just want to know like outside of making films and acting what inspires you uh, on the outside to make you want to make films and act and all that Ooh, um music mm -hmm. is kind of a driving force for me um I think everybody kind of has that moment in in their day or in their imagination where you're like listening to a song and driving and you're like this could be a movie mm, um, yeah. I see like almost everything that way when I'm just listening to music stories flood in um I just I get excited about all of my my imagination's capabilities and I just want I want to tell stories yeah. and I also um I think I'm also motivated just by humanity in general. Like people have so many important things to tell each other. So it's mm. really story. Story is my my inspiration. It's like if I listen to a, a podcast or I or I hear a story from my friend and it's something that could help someone else, um, something that could create a movement towards something else or something that benefits the world or nature, I immediately start going like, ooh, let's make it a movie. Like it just just yeah. everything to me is a movie I just want to make movies <laughs> yeah that's awesome yeah, it, yeah. It, it's so cool like you're in the position to do that as well too and even like one thing I love about like doing these segments as well is uh I always get like a bit of a charge talking to a person like you and like after I'm done like I feel like inspired and want to just work harder on my own things it's just uh I don't know do you feel that like uh being around like certain different people energies and like prior to like kind of blowing up in as like an actress did you feel like that that charge was a little dimmer in your life not being around the industry or well I would say like the dance industry is really constraining creatively mm -hmm. um so when I got out of it I was like oh I get to have my own thoughts this is awesome I don't have to like have a, a big scary ba ballet teacher yelling at me all day. Like I can, I can ask for what I want. Like this, this whole, the ballet world is so rigid about every single piece of it. And you're dealing with like most of the people who are the directors are retired dancers. So they're not dancing anymore. So they're not getting to, to be as creative as they were. So they get a taste of power and they start kind of kicking your butt. Um, so when I 
stepped out of that and I was able to really like energetically connect with people for the first time in a really long time. Um, sports can be, you know, in general, they can be really isolating, um, especially if you're doing like a single person sport. I'm in a ballet company, but it's not a team because somebody has to be Cinderella and it's probably going to be me and then everyone else is going to hate me. <laughs> There's this like balance that you find in, in dealing with all that, but I feel like since I stopped dancing and I've stepped into this acting space, which has been like a roller coaster of successes and failures in the last five years that I've been doing it, it's it's not just like, oh, you got a golden globe and now you have everything. It's like, oh, you got a golden globe, but are you still just a ballet dancer? You know, are, are you, we're not sure where you fit. So finding this autonomy away from ballet and away from the label of ballet and into acting and producing. And I do a lot of like climate work. I do activism, climate, climate space. And like, I am just so thrilled to be able to have my own voice now mm, um, yeah. that everybody's energy is like, yes. Like, I just feel so motivated to connect with people on all different levels, whether it's, you know, the biggest TV producer to like, you know, this team that I did the movie with, they, they sent an email to my manager and they spelled my name wrong. My manager was like, eh, I don't know who these people are, you know, and, and then I got in contact because I'm, I'm looking at this, the deck that they sent and it's so creative and they didn't have any money and they, you know, they're asking me to do this movie and audition for it with a first time feature director, like. And I'm like the kind of person that's like, why wouldn't I say yes to this when their vision is so good? Yeah, I'm not going to make a ton of money. I'm not, this isn't going to be some film that goes to the Oscars. This is not, you know, but it's worth making this connection with these incredible, like basically kids, they're in their mid twenties. They're all from Colombia, and they're making this movie that is so impactful and so special. And they were such amazing people, um, you know, I, I feel like I've grown just being allowing that energetic connection with them. That's yeah. awesome. I, I respect that so much, Sarah. And I, like you mentioned too, um, sometimes you can take those passion projects and it might not look like it's going to turn into like the biggest thing, but sometimes those are like the most monumental moments or just because you put that kind of like raw, real energy into it, it does turn into something you don't expect in and just make something like a special piece. And also I want to know like, what is that movie out or is it you, you guys are making it so, or? The, this is, this is the one, you know, we're, oh, we're going to okay. be yeah. premiering, premiering at um, the Inside Out Festival in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And then we have two other queer festivals that I'm not allowed to announce yet, but we're mm -hmm. headlining pretty much all of them or we have like a centerpiece at all of the like major queer festivals this year. Um, so it's worth, you know, it was worth, taking the risk to try to make some art with some, you know, an NYU graduate, you know, <laughs> director and, and just try. Um, I think, I think the movie is, you know, it's not sold yet. So we'll see what happens in the process of these festivals, but it will, you know, be available on streaming eventually. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely after this interview too, I'm going to plug the festival and as it's going along, if it goes to like a streaming service, we're obviously going to keep resharing it too. And even now, I am a big fan of you, Sarah. Like, from I was a fan watching this movie, and now just kind of like hearing your journey and what's in your heart and soul, it's like uh, I want to just keep tabs on your career as well and uh, and follow the next one. And uh, do you have? I know your focus is this movie right now, but uh, do you got anything else in the works or anything you can talk about? Or yeah, um, so I just also finished a movie that's at the LA Film Festival and Lionsgate is pre uh, presenting it and it's called Mid-Century. That's a horror movie. Um, I like to do horror movies a lot. Amazing. And that one is starring um, Shane, Shane West. Um, he is, I believe, most famous for A Walk to Remember. And um, Stephen Lang from Don't Breathe. Oh, and cool. Bruce Dern is in it. It's a, it's pretty, pretty out there, wacky political horror. So yeah. <laughs> that one's going to be released probably in the next couple of months. Oh, really cool. It, what's the title for that? Mid-Century. Mid-Century. All right, cool. I'm going to have to look out for that one. 
Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, before uh, we take off, I just want to thank you so much for your time today. It's a, it's a pleasure to meet you. And once again, it's like after this interview too, I became even more of a fan of yours. It's, uh, it's so cool to hear like, uh, that you advocate for different types of like, psychedelics and natural healing and just even your whole journey of like a dancer transitioning into like the actor world it's it's cool and it feels like right now like you kind of found a strive of just being a free spirit and doing what you love as a profession and I think um a lot of people can get a lot of inspiration from that so thank you yeah yeah I mean it does I'd rather be uh be doing what makes me happy at any cost so <laughs> yeah it's very important yeah and be, before we take off is there anything you'd like to say um just thank you I really appreciate you having me on and I I really hope that some people make it out in, in Canada to the festival I think it's going to be really special and it's like you know it's freak culture come be a freak <laughs> hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> amazing Sarah thank you once again hope you have a wonderful day and uh, hope to catch up with you down the road for your next film or whatever you're up to. Me too. Thank you. Hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Sarah Hay. I seriously love that one so much. I feel like this has been one of my favorite recordings of this year. And like we mentioned at the beginning, her film Unidentified Objects is playing at the Inside Out Film Fest in Toronto this week, May 27th. And I also believe if you can't get there live, it is streaming for a handful of days around that. So go look into that if you're interested. And with that being said, I think we need to get Sarah on a future episode. Maybe do a deeper dive in the mushroom and alien talk. You know what I'm saying, guys? That'd be so much fun. And before we go, I want to give a special thanks to all you legends on the Patreon. I mentioned in the last handful of episodes that I used to pay to produce this type of content for you. And now, because of your love and support, we're breaking even, baby. Hell yeah. But first up, the co-producer, Jeremy Hopkin of Hopkin Design. The queen, Ola Mazuka of Sonic Fold. Ryan Watkins of Ryan Radio. Amanda McKnight of Top 10 Nerd, Pat Maloney, Ryan Campbell, Devin Staple, Devin McBride, Ramshi. Check out his music, it's hammer time, baby. Mike Gulio, Jenny Potter, Jared Pepper Bronstein, aka Mr. Spicy. And last but not least, Francis Coffer, aka my mom. If you'd also like a shout out at the end of each and every one of these episodes and also get these episodes extra early, raw and uncut, right when I'm done the conversation, I take the Zoom call and I throw it right on the Patreon for you. No edits. And also be a badass motherfucker who supports raw, independent media. You can go to patreon.com slash the creative imbalance and do all that. And forever have my love, appreciation, and thanks. And with all that being said, we got some great episodes coming for you around the corner. Appreciate you. Hope you have a great day and all your dreams come true. Love ya.